today we're going to be using Simulink specifically, um, which is one of the tools um, that's built on top of MATLAB to design and simulate a grid tied solar inverter system. Uh, what we mean by that is that's going to be a utility scale um, a solar array uh, that is connected into uh, basically three phase AC power. Uh, so we're going to have inverters, of course, that are going to convert the uh, the power that we're getting off of the the DC panels um, into uh, the AC waveforms that the grid requires. Right. We're also going to talk about um, some very important topics uh, whenever you're actually going to do uh, grid tests. Right. And so what's really important is um, different parts of the world have different grid codes um, that are mandatory. So when you are actually connecting into the utility grid, you need to adhere to those. So um, we're going to talk specifically about some like IEEE 1547. Um, that's that's a pretty uh, common one these days, um, but there are many others. Um, and uh, we'll also talk about how you can test these systems, right? Specifically this concept of hardware in the loop. And we'll talk about how you can actually test the controls that are designed, even if they're implemented, say, onto a uh, DSP or like something like a um, Texas Instruments processor. Um, once you've actually implemented the control software there, you can actually test it rather than going out into the field and connecting that up to the actual utility scale system. You can test it in, in kind of your lab or in uh, your home setting as well. Okay. So really, I think the, the main takeaways from my presentation today are that um, you can use MATLAB and Simulink to really uh, simplify the control development process for power electronic systems, right? And kind of the whole idea with this is being able to build a model. You can use that model for not only control design, but testing as well. Uh, and that's very important. Um, the other key thing that I want to emphasize is we're going to talk about how the, that you can build stuff in Simulink and you can convert that into C code that can be directly used for both plant simulations, um, but also for deployed code. So if you're actually, um, if you design, say, a maximum PowerPoint tracking algorithm for your uh, solar facility, you can actually deploy that out uh, and use that actual um, generated Z code wherever you want. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, the example we'll focus on today is basically uh, utility scale um, solar, specifically testing some fault ride through conditions. So being able to actually test uh, fault conditions in the lab on a hardware in the loop simulator. Okay, and so at a high level, these are the same concepts. We're going to focus on three things today, um, building simulations, using them for control design, uh, and then also testing. Okay. All right. So when I talk about hardware in the loop testing, really what I'm talking about is the ability to test implemented control code. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is anytime you're actually taking software out into the field, be it on, say, a utility scale solar system like we're talking about today, or an electric vehicle, or, you know, um, you know, more other applications as well, that software is being implemented on some kind of control board, right? That could be a DSP, it could be a PLC, it's some type of controller that's actually going to live with the equipment in the field, right? Um, that controller, of course, is going to be connected to the actual hardware as well. Okay. And so at the end of the day, you're designing a system where you have software that you've built that's communicating with actual hardware. Okay. Now, if you say write all this, say, C code from scratch and then connect that directly up to, um, you know, the high voltage equipment, if you have any mistakes in that software code, that's going to result in some major issues, right? You could end up destroying some very expensive equipment, right? And so uh, one of the very common workflows that we see is rather than directly going straight to this hardware situation, um, you can actually um, replace that hardware with a hardware in the loop simulation. Uh, and then another important thing that I mentioned is when we're actually dealing with um, uh, large scale systems, there are going to be faults, right? On the utility grid, there are uh, weather events, um, there are you know malfunctions of equipment, um, you know maintenance issues that have to go through, and so there are going to be faults that occur. Your software that you design needs to be adequately uh, robust. To actually, you know, adapt to those situations. And so, one of the things that uh, a lot of standard boards have decided is, if we have a bunch of events, 
we want to be able to have equipment that's designed in a simil similar way to prevent cascading failures. For example, if the voltage starts to drop on equipment, um, if all the equipment sees a voltage drop, maybe everything decides to trip off at say, uh, you know, 7.7 .7 per unit uh, voltage. If everything trips at the same time, that's gonna further um, cascade that problem. And now we're gonna have uh, potentially a widespread blackout situation, right? And so what grid codes basically say is under certain conditions, you need to remain connected to the grid. You need to do things like provide reactive power to stabilize the situation and not make it worse by disconnecting, okay? And so to test fault situations, it's very difficult to do this with hardware, right? You could try to do it, right? You can build very large capacitor banks or resistive uh, banks, actually try to mimic faults with real equipment. But you know what we're gonna say today is rather than try to do that, we can actually use a simulation that we've built on the desktop um, and then convert that over into a uh, virtual plant, um, basically a real-time simulation of the system connect up the controller like we've done before, but instead of to the real equipment, we connect it up um, using low level IOs, um, analog and digital IOs, for example, to a uh, real time simulation of that plant. That allows us to do not only healthy tests, so the plant under uh, healthy conditions, but also faulty conditions, um, grid faults and all sorts of stuff like that, so that we can actually understand if our controller is you know, robust to both um, normal nominal operation and also faulty. And so that really helps, okay? And so we can, you know, test and uh, test many different scenarios that would be very difficult to replicate on um, actu actual hardware, okay? So today what we're gonna do is give an overview of this. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be presenting for the next 30 minutes or so, and then I'll pass it off to my colleague. Um, and so we're gonna ta start off by talking about, you know, the modeling side, right? How can we put together a representative model of the system that allows us to do very common things, right? Uh, and so we have components that represent the photovoltaic panels, uh, the inverter, and grid models as well. Uh, and then we need to do some other important tasks like actually design the control system, okay? Uh, and then ultimately we'll actually talk about hardware in the loop uh, testing. So um, today as the example, the representative example, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are using a uh, utility scale uh, solar inverter system as our example, and this is going to be a grid tied system. Uh, and so at a high level, there's three main components to the system. We've got the, the, the panels themselves. Um, so this could be, you know, um, just a single panel that you might have on a residential system. Um, but in this case, we're actually looking at this as a 500 um, kilowatt installation. So uh, larger installation. So that's the main piece. Um, basically, this is going to produce electricity, um, DC uh, voltage or current um, from irradiance that is received from the sun. The next and potentially the most important piece to this case is the inverter. This is going to take that DC power that's produced by the panels and then convert it into um, AC waveforms that can be, then be accepted by the grid. In this case, because we're actually using um, a grid tied connection into the utility system rather than a single phase AC waveform, we're actually gonna be looking at an inverter that's gonna convert into three phase uh, AC. Um, and so that's gonna be the focus of today's presentation. So this is kind of at a high level what we're looking at. And then of course the grid itself. Representative in Simulink, this model would look uh, as follows. We've got the panel, we've got the inverter, uh, and then we've got the grid connection, okay? So I'm gonna actually hop over to my Simulink installation here and take a look at that same, that same model, okay? Uh, and so Simulink, uh, for those of you that maybe haven't used it or haven't seen it in a while, it's a block diagram modeling environment. It's built on top of MATLAB, kind of our flagship tool. And it allows us to simulate many different types of systems, right? So mechanical systems, electrical systems, controls, software, um, today, I have a representative uh, model of this utility scale solar system. I've got here uh, the block that represents our panels. I've got the inverter, and then I've got our grid connection. Okay. And in these, uh, basically in the, say, the, um, the uh, 
solar uh, system here, we have kind of uh, subsystems that represent different components. So on the grid inverter, I can double click, go into this block and take a look at the subcomponents here. You'll see I have a three level uh, converter here. This is gonna take the DC voltage on this side uh, and then uh, through control mechanism here, which we'll be designing today is going to convert that DC power into AC, three phase AC, which is then gonna go through a harmonic filter to kind of uh, dampen out some of the harmonics that we're injecting into the grid. And then we have a transformer to, to scale that um, generated electricity up to the, uh, the grid voltage, okay, to 20, 25 kV. Uh, and then from here, we can go into the grid connection. You'll notice here I have a block in addition to the kind of the components representing the a, a nominal uh, grid here. I also have a block that represents a fault, okay? And so what this allows me to do is uh, fault the system in many different ways uh, so that I can make sure that the controller that I design can um, um, adequately account for these situations. Low voltage ride through, frequency deviations, uh, low frequency events, uh, so on and so forth, okay? Uh, what I'll do right now is I'm going to push play. I'm going to run this simulation of this, um, this solar plant here, and we'll take a look at what's actually going on, okay? So these scopes are running the simulation here. Pull that other one back up. And so what I actually have here, um, this plot here is showing the, uh, the voltage um, produced by the inverter. The second plot is showing the current produced by the inverter. Uh, and this is uh, the voltage on the PV panel. Uh, and then these plots are showing the active and um, reactive um, uh, power that's being produced by the panel, okay? And so what we see here is initially this, this uh, PV facility is actually not connected to the grid. We're in what we call an islanded mode. Uh, so this, a uh, solar facility is operating independent of the grid. Uh, we're generating voltage waveforms without uh, a grid connection. Um, at 10 seconds, we actually connect to the grid. Um, and the, re the way you can see that is if I zoom in here, the current out of the uh, inverter goes from zero to some uh, positive value. Uh, you can also see that we start actually producing active power uh, into the grid. Uh, and so that's a way that we can see that this facility is no longer just operating independently. We're actually providing power into the grid. At 20 seconds, um, what actually occurs is we have a grid fault. Uh, so the way you can see that over here is the voltage on the uh, solar facility drops, right? And so you can see uh, at that point uh, that voltage drops, the current maintains, and um, what we see here is actually as a result of this fault, we're actually in a mode where we're injecting additional reactive power to try to maintain that voltage to support the grid uh, during the, the, uh, the difficult time, okay? So, um, you know, that's kind of what's going on, okay? Now, how this is actually being decided, and we'll talk about these in a little more detail, is um, we've got, the controls of this uh, this three phase inverter, okay? And there's a few things going on here. Um, essentially, at a low level, we're controlling the current. Uh, and then depending on if we're islanded or not, we're either uh, injecting current or we're going to do a, what's called grid forming. We're going to provide a voltage. And the way that we're actually deciding which mode that we're operating in is through this little state machine here. And so this is showing us that this um, solar facility has a couple of different um, operating modes. We're either islanded, um, and if we are islanded, if uh, we don't detect the grid, we just, just we're just in grid forming mode. We're we're kind of just operating. If we do detect the grid, what we do is we uh, go into synchronization, and once we've actually synchronized with the grid, we connect to the grid, um, and then again, you know, if there's a fault. Uh, we go into a fault condition. So I'm going to rerun this simulation one more time. And we can actually see as these different conditions occur. So right now, um, we're, we've detected the grid, we're synchronizing, we've uh, just connected. You can see that uh, we made that connection, we're nominal. 
at about 20 seconds, we should see that fault again. You see that we're in the fault voltage fault mode. And then if the fault was severe enough, we can island. Um, and so in this case, we did island. And then again, after a certain amount of time, we see if the fault is cleared. And if it has, we can uh, resynchronize and connect again. Okay. Uh, so using the state machine, we can kind of see at a high level uh, what's actually going to go on. So this is kind of like the supervisory uh, supervisory controller on top of the lower level. Uh, so that at a high level uh, is kind of what's going on here. Okay. So um, I do see there's a question um, about the, the presentation slides. So we will be providing these uh, the slides uh, today. Um, the the other thing to note here is um, the controls themselves. In addition to the supervisory level controls, uh, we do have these lower level controls that are controlling voltage. And that's going to be more kind of your standard uh, feedback loop, right? Measure a value like uh, the desired voltage that you want this panel to operate at, and then have a uh, feedback loop that's going to drive that error to zero uh, with, through a PID mechanism. Um, so for our first exercises that I'm going to show today, we're going to focus on the PID design um, uh, using these systems. Okay. Now, before I get into the specifics of PID, uh, I do want to cover, I think, a very important topic uh, when we're talking about electrical simulation, which is um, what level of fidelity that you need to model your system at uh, when you're looking at different uh, control tasks. Okay, um, There's this concept called uh, IEEE uh, 1676. It's this whole idea of uh, power, uh, power electronic building block libraries. Uh, I like to view things in this way because it really helps us uh, break down you know, very specific control tasks with the level of fidelity of modeling that I might need, right? Uh, with Simulink and our SimScape electrical tool, you can go from switch mode, high frequency power electronics, all the way to like uh, positive sequence phaser level simulation where you're just looking at active and reactive power, right? And so depending on the fidelity that you need, uh, you can you know use different modes, okay? And so today we're not gonna spend too much time speaking of about, uh, about switching uh, simulation, but Power electronics with uh, systems use um, IGBTs and MOSFETs to actually control uh, the system. So these are switch devices on and off. Um, most of these systems are operating in the kilohertz uh, range. And so um, those simulations are typically going to have time steps that are very small so that you can get those transients. Where this is really important is if you're looking at the switch mode control, um, and then in particular, if you're really interested in harmonic analysis, you really need to make sure you have that level of fidelity in your simulation. Um, for a lot of control types, which we'll be focusing on today, uh, voltage and frequency regulation, um, reactive power control, transient smoothing, we're focused at this level on the converter level control, where we can basically look at things in terms of an uh, average value approximation, right? Uh, and so this allows us to, increase those step sizes of their simulation and have it run a lot faster, um, basically in real time. Uh, and that simulation I was running just a little bit ago, it was you know, a 30 to 40 second simulation. Uh, we were in, in this type of simulation uh, mode for that. And then lastly, there's kind of this system level uh, simulation mode. And again, this is if you're wanting to study the effects of your uh, microgrids or your solar facilities um, in terms of like, weeks or years where you want to simulate long-term uh, studies but don't necessarily need to get to the low-level uh, control uh, tasks, right? So this is really good if you're going to be participating in energy markets or doing things like peak shaving, uh, looking at long-term load forecasts, that type of stuff, okay? And again, you can break this down into the controls, right? Uh, so today we're going to be focused primarily on, on these buckets, um, but we do have presentations um, on the MathWorks website that get into all of these topics. Okay. So um, the first task we're going to cover today is actually looking at the inverter. Okay. And so in the model that I had, I have this PV panel. The draw, main drawback of uh, PV is that it's producing DC power. Um, and most wall outlets and the utility grid um, are operating in AC, right? And so a conversion between the two uh, is essential, right? And so uh, the way that you do this, of course, is an inverter. 
uh, for three phase, of course, you're going to have this kind of um, basically a three a three phase H bridge type inverter set up uh, with six switches at a minimum. Uh, and basically, by controlling when these switches open and close, that's how you can basically convert this DC power into AC. Okay. Um, we won't get into too much details about this, but there are basically components that represent PWM generation. Um, if you are curious, we do have a library in Simulink, uh, Simscape, and then Electrical. And in the Specialized Power Systems Library, for example, if we go into here and look into controls, and then pulse and signal generation, uh, you'll see that there's, these are all pre-built, um, and we could grab something like a uh, three-level PWM generator. If you double-click on that, you'll see that this is actually going to be generating um, PWN uh, signals for a 12 pulse bridge, right? Uh, and so, you know, the logic to kind of do this is pretty standard uh, if you wanted to get these um, directly, right? The signal for this, this UREF input that you see on this block, this is going to be our um, duty cycle, right? Uh, and so for a simple, say, DC DC converter, that duty cycle is going to be some range from zero to one. Uh, and so, depending on if you're boosting a signal or um, or attenuating the signal, that zero to one is going to control the, uh, control the voltage, right? Uh, for a more complex waveform like this, it's going to range from negative one to one, and it's going to be more of a sinusoidal type waveform. Okay, uh, what's really going to be deciding that value between minus one and one is going to be a PID a feedback loop. So essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to measure the panel voltage, so the PV side over here. We're going to compare that to a desired PV panel voltage. Of course, that's going to give us an error. And then we're going to have a PID controller that's going to control that. Okay. Um, and so we can actually do this in Simulink. And I'm going to walk through an example of this. We'll close the main model. We'll come back to that. Go to the control design example here. <clears throat> and so I have a very similar model to the one that I showed before. This one here, um, we've got our grid connection, and then we've got our um, uh, solar facility. I've removed some of the pieces from the, uh, the inverter controller just to keep things a, uh, a little more simple. Uh, we don't have the kind of the mode selection in this case. And so here's that PID loop right now. So basically, we're, we're wanting to specify a voltage that the panel is at. We measure the actual voltage of the panel. We have a PID loop that's going to basically calculate a lower level signal that will go into this current regulator. Um, this is another PID loop, but ultimately that goes into um, a signal generator that goes into our uh, power electronic system. Um, if I run this simulation right now, I have a little scope here. We can kind of see what the uh, the voltage response is. So my PV panel starts off with a voltage of 510 volts. Um, at 0.4 seconds, I issue a step uh, change in the voltage to uh, 410 volts, uh, and we can see that the panel does respond. Um, it looks okay. And there's a little bit of overshoot, and so we might want to change the uh, the transient performance. Maybe speed this up a little bit more. Um, and so the way that we can do that is in this feedback loop controller, we can either adjust these gains by by um, by hand, by just like changing these values, maybe to 10 here, I'll change my P uh, gain to 10. We can, of course, rerun and just visually see the uh, the difference. I did, a, I did improve the results a little bit. Um, that's, you know, one method of doing this. The other is actually using, uh, automated PID tuning. And so you'll notice here in my PID block, I can click tune. What this is actually going to do is try to get a linear approximation of the, the full model. Um, so this is, uh, you know, going to look at not only just this um, single PID system here, but the, the broader model, try to identify a linear plant, uh, and then allow me to kind of do the uh, control tuning process. So we'll let that start up here. I 
And in this case, what we'll do real quick is relinearize this at um, closed loop. We'll grab a snapshot at 0.3 seconds. Basically, um, in some situations, the, the, the plant model, if there's zero initial conditions, um, might not find a, a good initial guess for the, uh, the approximation. And so now you see that I've got a, 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 a transient response here, and I can start to adjust this. So um, you'll notice that I can make my response faster. You'll notice this is, of course, classic control design um, quandaries. If you speed your system up too much, um, you may run into the uh, stability margins of that control system. And so I can maybe slow this back down and get a response that I'm happy with. And then I can update those values back to the block, right? Um, and once I've done that, I can apply those and rerun this, okay? And so it's a, it's a way to use the model that you've created to actually design and test controllers, right? And we can see the performance looks a lot better, uh, faster, faster response and less overshoot. All right. The next kind of task on top of basically just the basic control of voltage is the synchronization aspect, right? Um, and so kind of the next stage to this is on top of just measuring that and basically a, uh, doing a voltage feedback loop, we need to basically either generate a waveform ourselves, or if we do want to connect to the grid, we, we <clears throat> excuse me, we need to measure the, the grid's um, voltage and then also its frequency. And we basically need to converge those so that the voltage that our uh, plant is generating and the voltage of the grid are the same. If we don't do that, and then we try to connect our um, solar generation plant to the grid, we're going to have a uh, extremely large control transients and potential arcing on the actual breaker system. And so, um, again, that's something that you don't want to happen in reality, right? Uh, in simulation, of course, it may just give you very crazy um, voltage transients, but in reality, that's going to cause uh, serious damage to the equipment, okay? And so the way that we can do that, just real quick, example here. is um, basically to measure that voltage. And again, the where, the where we're actually doing that is we're using uh, a block called a uh, phase lock loop or PLL. What this does is it measures the grid and then it calculates the frequency of the grid. Um, and we, so we can actually see the frequency and the angle. Uh, and then we can see the frequency of the waveform we're generating compare the two, and if they're slightly offset, we want to drive that error to zero. So very much like a PID controller. Um, and the way that we do that is, like I said, through a PID. And so basically we measure the uh, voltage and frequency of the grid, we measure the output of our inverter, and then we use that in a PID loop just like we did before to um, minimize the error. Okay. And so I'll run this simulation real quick. Take a look at this grid synchronization. So we'll see the the blue is our inverter waveform. The the yellow is the um, grid. And at 0.2 seconds we connected, and you'll see that those waveforms are perfectly lined up, right? So if I rerun that really quick, at about 0.2 seconds we're going to connect to the grid, but you can see. We initially start with a difference in those waveforms. We have that feedback loop to try to minimize the error between the two. And then at a certain point, the error is small enough that we can actually close the breaker and connect, okay? Um, and so that's how we can actually connect uh, to the utility grid, okay? Now, for the sake of time today, um, I won't get into too much of the details of this, but uh, one of the other pieces of, um, this comes up specifically for um, solar, 
um, for wind as well, is um, the generation of uh, power from a panel depends on the, the voltage, um, but also depends on the irradiance, right? Um, and so there's these complex uh, nonlinear curves that you typically see where irradiant, as the irradiance changes, this maximum power point uh, changes. Uh, so you can see like the panel voltage where the uh, maximum power is uh, for this curve is different, say, from this lower curve. To make this panel produce maximum power at all time, we need to have an algorithm that can actually seek out where these maximum power points are as the irradiance on the panel changes. So if a cloud goes by, or if it's a winter day versus a summer day, uh, we want to be able to automatically adjust this PV voltage to always find that maximum point. Okay? And so there are algorithms called maximum power point tracking. Again, for the sake of time, I won't go into that too much of the details today, but this is an example of a method called perturb and observe. Uh, it basically uses just small deviations to kind of incrementally change the uh, PV voltage panel so that if, you know, irradiance changes, you can see that it, uh, the voltage fell, but then it will slowly kind of converge to a maximum point, okay? Uh, so we do have a webinar where we talk in more detail about this. Again, you'll have these slides so you can take a look at that. Um, but we go into more detail on how to implement these types of algorithms. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, um, on the fault ride through side, uh, there's this whole idea of grid codes. And so the example that I showed at the very beginning was, you know, we had islanded mode, we had grid connected mode, and then we have this whole idea of uh, voltage fault ride through. Okay. And so at a certain time, there was a, uh, we did simulate a grid fault. And we actually have this little algorithm here that passes us into a lookup table that compares us to specific uh, fault ride through uh, situations, okay? And so if, if we're within the uh, specified margins, uh, we remain connected to the grid, um, but if the fault is long enough that um, we now exceed the uh, fault ride through tolerance, we can uh, trip from the grid, okay? So that's what this is showing here. We do have um, blocks, example blocks. Um, we have a, a webinar here that goes into more detail about this as well. Um, but basically, it's a block that you can feed in voltage and frequency, and it will help you see if your, your system is uh, adhering to the grid code. In this case, this is 1547, um, or if it's uh, tripping before it should. Now, the, the, the benefit of having done all of this in Simulink, creating these models in Simulink, is all of the stuff that I've created, both the plant model and all of the controls, I can convert to C code. Um, and this allows me to do a lot of stuff, right? One such thing I can do is I can take the algorithms that I've created, like the, uh, the voltage controllers that we designed, the maximum power point algorithm, and I can convert all of that to C code, and then take that over to a tool like Code Composer Studio, and then actually deploy that onto a um, Texas Instruments processor. Okay, so that's actually what we did for this case. On the flip side, on the plant side, the actual um, solar inverter model, I can actually take that um, and convert that to C code as well, and then put that onto a real-time simulator. Okay, so now I have a real-time simulation of my plant model, and I have the actual control code running on a DSP, and that allows me to do hardware in the loop testing, okay, which we discussed at the beginning. Okay. And what that looks like here is, here's that same model that we've been working with. I'm gonna play a video here of that. What we've done is, rather than having um, all the blocks, we have these things called uh, driver blocks. So we actually generate C code to represent the, con the connection to um, the ADCs, so the analog and digital converters that you would connect up directly. You can then run this in real time. This will actually convert this over to the C code, package that up and put that onto a real time simulator. Let's see here, oops, sorry about that. See this taskbar here, so sorry about that. 
And then once we've done that, we can actually then deploy this to the uh, hardware in the loop uh, simulation system. Okay, and so this is the C code generation process. Here is the, the microcontroller. So this is our Texas Instruments process. So this is where the maximum PowerPoint tracking, the default ride through controls, all of that resides. This is the hardware in the loop simulator. This is a dedicated machine for simulating um, the equipment. And this is allowing us to simulate basically the PWM waveforms in this case, uh, the voltage signal, and then um, all the other situations. So you can see here we can adjust things as the simulation is running. We're changing the irradiance in this case, and you can see how that reflects in the simulation. And we can see the individual waveforms. So this allows us to test the controller um, and to inject things like faults to test, you know, if we're actually if the controller we designed is effective. Okay. So um, with that, I'll wrap up. And so you know, Simulink and um, our electrical simulation tools allows you to basically take uh, simulations that you've created in Simulink and use them for many applications, right? Um, for con code generation for software um, and for um, hardware in the loop testing. And then you can basically, um, you know, test things that you wouldn't be able to test, say, in a uh, lab-based setting, like, um, you know, extreme grid faults that would actually occur um, in uh, the real world that you would want to make sure your controller uh, works with. Okay. Um, and we do have some additional resources here uh, in the slides that um, you'll be able to access once you have the slides. All right, so um, with that, that is, I think, my time. Uh, okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Yan Xu. Uh, I'm working at NTU Singapore. Uh, also, on behalf of IEEE Power and Energy Society Singapore chapter, uh, it is our great pleasure to co-organize this webinar. Uh, after Jonathan's uh, presentation, uh, my talk will be more on the system level coordinated control of distributed energy resources, DERs, uh, in microgrids. Uh, so by DERs, uh, here I mean the uh, distributed generation units, uh, of course, including solar PV, uh, wind turbine, uh, as well as diesel generators, uh, which are controllable, and also includes the uh, energy storage systems, uh, as well as the flexible controllable loads. Mm, okay, so this is the uh, outline of my presentation, uh, which is uh, relatively shorter. Uh, so first of all, I will give you a general introduction of an uh, ongoing uh, microgrid demonstration project in Singapore, uh, which is called REITS. And after that, I will talk about our research works on the DR control uh, for a landed microgrid and grid-connected microgrid. Uh, okay, uh, since uh, 2015, uh, our university, NTU, is leading a, a microgrid demonstration project, uh, which is called Renewable Energy uh, Integration Demonstrator Singapore, uh, RIS for short. Uh, this is an industry-oriented project uh, to develop a research and develop, uh, development uh, platform uh, for test bedding and uh, demonstrating the DER and the microgrid technologies. Uh, so if you are more interested, you can uh, find the uh, information in this website. Uh, later on, we will share our slides as well. Okay, uh, as everybody knows, uh, Singapore is, uh, is an islanded country. Uh, so you can see the map from the east to the west, we have 40 kilometers. From north to the south, we have 30 kilometers. Uh, so this is our university, and this is the so-called uh, Semico Island, where the microgrid project is uh, built up. Uh, so in this uh, island, uh, we have uh, about uh, 40, uh, 64 uh, thousand uh, square meters uh, to build up this uh, microgrid test bed. As I said, this is an industry-oriented project. Uh, so we have received the funds from the government agency, and we also have the industry partners. Uh, so far, we have about more than 20 industry partners involved in this project. Uh, so this is a general framework of this uh, REITS project. Uh, we have two phases. Uh, for the first one, we are uh, developing four independent microgrids, uh, each of uh, 500 kilowatt to 1 megawatt each. And second phase, we have another four uh, microgrids in a cluster configuration. Uh, the capacity is uh, relatively smaller, ranging from 100 kilowatt to 150 uh, kilowatt. Uh, so what we are building now is a so-called hybrid uh, network 
network the microgrid system. So in total, we have eight uh, sub microgrids. Uh, so you can see that uh, in terms of the generation resources, we have a diesel generator, which is controllable. Uh, we have renewable energy resources coming from uh, solar PV, uh, a small wind turbine. Uh, also, we have uh, marine uh, renewables. And in terms of energy storage systems, we have a mix of different types of the uh, units, including the batteries, supercapacitors, uh, flywheel, uh, as well as uh, hydrogen. Uh, and uh, we have the on-site uh, loads and the other service loads. Uh, so each of the microgrid can be uh, uh, interconnected into the common uh, coupling uh, bus, and they can also work in a landed mode and uh, uh, grid-connected mode. Uh, as I said, this is an industry-oriented project, so we have a couple of uh, industry partners involved. Uh, so each of the uh, uh, sub-microgrids is actually uh, built up and owned, operated by the industry partners. Uh, so we can see a lot of big names such as uh, Rolls-Royce, uh, NG from France, uh, as well as Schneider, uh, EDF from France, uh, etc. And we also have some uh, small startup companies uh, which are developing the energy management systems, uh, controllers for the microgrid. Uh, so we are collaborating with them closely. Uh, you can find more uh, information in this website. Okay, so this is the electrical infrastructure of the uh, hybrid network the microgrid system. You can see we have a total of uh, eight uh, sub microgrids. Uh, so microgrid zero is owned by our university. Uh, all of the sub microgrids are interconnected through this uh, 6.6 .6 kilowatt linkage bus. Uh, some uh, on-site pictures, uh, you can see we have a solar PV, uh, energy storage system, etc. Uh, this is a small wind turbine, uh, but I need to highlight that this is uh, uh, the largest uh, wind turbine in Singapore uh, because we, we are located in the equator, so we don't have uh, a lot of wind resources. Uh, so this wind turbine is to transferring the low speed uh, wind turbine. Okay, so in our research group, uh, we are uh, focusing on the system level coordination of these uh, de uh, distributed energy resources. Uh, so basically, we are looking at three types of the DRs. Uh, they are flexible, controllable loads, uh, including the demand response programs, uh, HVAC, uh, smart buildings. And uh, for the energy storage, we are considering the batteries, uh, supercapacitors, as well as the thermal energy storage systems. And for the distributed generators, we are considering the dispatchable uh, units, such as the micro turbine. Uh, as well as the combined chilling, uh, chilling, chilling uh, heating uh, power plant unit, CCHP for short, uh, as well as a non-dispatchable uh, renewable unit, uh, such as the solar PV and the wind turbine. And the specific research problems, we cover the full spectrum of, uh, from the control uh, to operation and to the planning. Uh, specifically for the control, we are looking at the primary and the secondary control for frequency and boil heat. Uh, for the operation level, we are looking at the energy management of the DRs, uh, as well as the voltage uh, reg uh, regulation. Uh, and for the planning, uh, we are looking at the optimal sizing and sizing of the DR, uh, DR units in the microgrids. And uh, for the methodologies, uh, we are developing um, different uh, control uh, methodologies, including the centralized control, decentralized control, distributed control. And we also uh, did some hardware in the loop test. And for the operation time scale, we are developing a robust optimization, uh, stochastic optimization based approach uh, to achieve optimal energy management and the voltage reactive power optimization. Well, for the planning, uh, also we adopt the optimization methodologies considering uh, uncertainties uh, to achieve the uh, cost effective uh, sizing and setting of the DR. Uh, because of the time and the topic um, of today, so my presentation uh, will mainly focus on the control level. Okay, so just to give you a general uh, quick introduction to the control of the microgrid. Uh, as we know, the microgrid can be operated in either uh, islanded mode or the grid connected mode. So for the islanded mode, the general uh, purpose is to control the voltage and the frequency and achieve the accurate power balancing. All right, and for the grid connected mode, because the frequency and the voltage are dominated by the main grid, so we are using, uh, we are utilizing the DER resources 
uh, to provide the frequency or voltage support. This is a general uh, principle. And in terms of the control architectures, basically we have uh, centralized control, uh, decentralized control, which uh, are more familiar to you. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about more on the distributed control, which means that there is no, uh, there is not a centralized controller and different control nodes just communicate with each other through neighboring to neighboring communication. And uh, generally speaking, the microgrid control follows a hierarchical manner. Uh, so at the bottom level, the primary control level, uh, we have the uh, inner control loops and the group control. Uh, I think this one has already been well covered by uh, Jonathan's presentation. The objective is to provide local uh, voltage and frequency uh, support and the preliminary power sharing. And after that, because the uh, primary control cannot achieve the accurate power sharing, so they cannot achieve, uh, they cannot restore the voltage and the frequency exactly. So we have another level of control, which is called secondary control. Uh, the objective here is to achieve uh, accurate power sharing, uh, balancing, and uh, accurate V and F restoration. And on top, the tertiary level, we have the economic dispatch or optimal power flow, which is more on the optimization of these resources. Uh, okay, so today uh, my mainly focus, my, uh, my major focus is on the secondary control of the DERs in the microgrid for a aligned mode and the grid connected mode. So I start uh, from the aligned mode. Uh, as I said, uh, our focus is more on the a, uh, a distributed control. So the principle is that we do not need a centralized controller. The control node only communicates with the neighboring nodes and they will share the information, uh, communication, and the computational burden among the nodes. So the advantage is that compared with the centralized control, they have a relatively higher resilience because they are immune to the uh, single point failure risk. They can also support plug and play functionalities and have a higher scalability uh, as well as it can pro uh, protect the data because the data is not uh, centrally collected. So this is an example of the communication graph where we have four uh, control nodes and this one can be converted into mathematically form formulated as the adjacent matrix uh, to describe the graph. And for the distributed control, basically we have two types. Uh, first one is the average consensus. Second one is so-called lead follower consensus. So for the average consensus, the objective is that all of the control nodes will achieve the same status which is the average of their initial status. Well, for the leader follower, that means the follower will uh, achieve the same status of the leader. Okay, so this is the general mathematical principle for the two uh, consensus algorithms. And for the controller design, uh, everybody is familiar with this uh, primary control, which is actually a job control. So basically the principle is that the job control will immediately respond uh, to the frequency or voltage uh, fluctuation by providing uh, uh, power, uh, reactive power or active power. So, however, this uh, primary control is essentially a proportional control so it cannot achieve the accurate uh, power balancing and cannot fully restore the frequency and the voltage. So we need to have the secondary control. The objective is actually to move this um, jump curve so that the power can be accurately balanced and V and F can be accurately restored. So this is the general uh, principle uh, flowchart uh, to derive the secondary uh, distributed control. So this is a job control formula. We take the derivative as a both sides. Then you can see that the frequency and the voltage can be denoted as this integral form. Then the objective actually is to decide this uh, uh, mu uh, for frequency and uh, uh, for frequency and voltage, uh, active power and reactive power. And the consensus, the principle for the consensus control is that uh, every control node want to achieve the same status, either uh, to be their initial status or the leader's status. So in other words, we are integrating the difference uh, between the different control nodes. So this is the general uh, principle. While the principle is relatively straightforward, we can actually develop uh, a different uh, a set of different uh, specific consensus algorithms. Uh, because of the time, I will not uh, introduce the details. Uh, and uh, we have actually also developed uh, 
uh, hardware in the loop, uh, cloud-based hardware in the loop platform to test the bed uh, to verify these uh, uh, distributed controllers. Uh, so here I'm introducing a, a so-called cross-national uh, HRL test bed, uh, which is a collaboration between our university uh, and the University of Strathclyde in UK and the University of uh, Grenoble in France. Uh, so in this platform, uh, we are actually uh, deploying um, two set of uh, controllers, respectively in UK and uh, France, uh, implemented in Raspberry Pi uh, microcontrollers. And through the Redis cloud server, uh, these two set of controllers can uh, control the microgrid uh, uh, model in uh, Singapore. And uh, this microgrid is simulated in the real time uh, simulator. Um, okay, so uh, this is some uh, testing results, simulation results. Uh, so as you can see, we have 10 uh, distributed generators, uh, each controller uh, for five DGs uh, respectively de deployed in UK and France. Uh, so through this cloud uh, communication, uh, we are controlling the, uh, the microgrid uh, deployed in Singapore. Uh, so we consider different types of the load, cha uh, load change, including the step load change and the real uh, power fluctuation change. Uh, so you can see that the developed controller, distributed controller can well uh, manage the uh, frequency and the voltage. And of course, for the distributed control, uh, the time delay, the communication burden is a major issue. So we also studied the, the impact of communication delay on the system performance. And uh, uh, the general uh, conclusion is that as long as the communication delay is, uh, is high, it will affect the, the, the performance. And uh, uh, beyond a certain limit, uh, the system control system become unstable. Well, a simple rule to uh, uh, address this communication delay is to uh, fine tune the control gain. So basically, uh, if we have a larger control gain, we can converge uh, faster. However, we can only uh, withstand a relatively small delay. Uh, on the uh, contrast, if we have a smaller control uh, control gain, the whole system can control slower, uh, but it can withstand a larger uh, time delay. And we also studied the impact of the communication failures on the whole uh, distributed control system. Uh, a very uh, straightforward conclusion is that, of course, if there is communication failures, it will affect the communication, uh, it will affect the convergence speed because the connectivity of the whole system is uh, damaged. And also, it cannot achieve inaccurate power sharing anymore. So if you are interested, you can uh, go to this uh, paper uh, for more uh, technical details. And uh, okay, so that uh, the above is for the islanded uh, mode, uh, microgrid operation mode. While for the grid tight operation mode, uh, we know that the frequency and the voltage will be uh, dominated by the main grid uh, through this uh, point of coupling connection, PCC. So in this case, we can still utilize the DER uh, to support the power uh, supports the frequency or the voltage to the main grid. So the first piece of the work I would like to introduce is, the, uh, is to utilize the uh, distributed energy storage system uh, to support the power system frequency control. The idea is that we want to aggregate the large number of small scale uh, energy storage units uh, to, to, uh, to provide the frequency support to the uh, main power grid. Okay, this is the model for the so-called load frequency control uh, and the Thailand power flow uh, and the secondary control uh, model. Uh, then we develop a leader follower uh, consensus controller uh, to aggregate uh, different uh, energy storage units uh, so that they can collectively uh, provide the frequency support. So we consider different communication topologies like uh, uh, this line loop, this ring loop, and uh, this is the general uh, mathematical uh, process to derive this uh, lead follower uh, consensus controller. And after that, you can see that uh, a, this uh, aggregated uh, energy storage system can provide the uh, power support to regulate the frequency. So uh, this is some testing results. You can see that without uh, the energy storage system, this is a flag, uh, frequency fluctuation. And uh, after our uh, using our proposed method, you can see the frequency fluctuation becomes much more smooth. And you can also see that the different energy storage units can achieve the uh, consensus uh, SOC, uh, which is uh, objective uh, in this uh, work. And another uh, part of support from the DRs is the uh, voltage uh, support 
uh, to the Mangrid. Uh, as uh, Jonathan also mentioned, uh, actually the, the, the inverters can provide the reactive power support to the grid, uh, such as during the fault uh, scenario. Uh, while in the state, state operation, they can also provide this reactive power support to regulate the uh, bus voltage in the microgrid. And uh, so in this uh, respect, we, in, in this aspect, we have developed a so-called uh, uh, hierarchical uh, three-level um, uh, controller uh, to utilize the solid PV inverter to provide uh, to regulate the voltage magnitude. Uh, basically, we have three uh, levels. The first level is to uh, run is to smooth the voltage fluctuation caused by solar PV active power fluctuation. So actually, this is a kind of a filter, a filter control that is to smooth, uh, filter out the, the fluctuations. A second level is a troop control, uh, which is to provide immediate uh, uh, reactive power support in response to a, a voltage fluctuation. While the third level is on a distributed control manner, uh, basically the different um, inverters will communicate to each other through neighboring to neighbor communication. Then they collectively provide the reactive power support to uh, regulate, uh, to restore the voltage magnitude. And we also did a simulation test and uh, hardware in the loop test. Uh, so you can see that with the ramp rate control, the uh, voltage fluctuation becomes more smooth. And with the proposed controller, uh, the voltage can, bus voltage can all be uh, managed within the threshold. Uh, and uh, we also did the power hardware in the loop test. While well, the above mentioned uh, cross national uh, uh, HIL platform is a controller hardware in the loop, while well, this one is a power hardware in the loop. As you can see, we have um, 15 uh, kilowatt converted to emulate the solar PV, and we have a 10 kilowatt load bank to emulate the load. Uh, both of them are interfaced by this 90 uh, kilowatt power interface. And uh, uh, so we can do a uh, power hardware in the loop. And we also studied, uh, this is a voltage control uh, profile. You can see they can be well managed within the threshold. Uh, we also studied the uh, stability of the distributed controller. This is the eigenvalues. Okay, so with this, I, I, I finished my presentation. Thank you very much.